Uh, at 866-HEY-LARS. That's 866-439-5277. Emails to talk at LarsLarson.com. And joining me right now is Alana Goodman. Alana Goodman, who is staff writer at the Washington Free Beacon. Alana, good to have you back on the program. Thanks for having me. I see that when it comes to abusing the IRS, the uh, Obama administration appears to be uh, diverse and uh, in, the, in that they're spreading the love of the IRS out to more than just uh, right-wing, uh, uh, right-wing uh, groups of, uh, of patriots. Yeah, well, some would say internationally. Um, so let me just give some background on this. Uh, so I'm sure you remember back in 2009, 2010, when the Obama administration was making its opposition to the settlement, basically the centerpiece of its Middle East policy. So around this time, there was an ongoing campaign also by White House allied groups like J Street um, to challenge the tax-exempt status of U.S. charities that were supporting settlements. Um, and there were a bunch of news reports at the time, uh, the biggest one being a front-page 5,000-word piece in the New York Times that quoted administration officials talking about what a problem these pro-Israel groups were. <laughs> so now if you fast forward to 2013, the IRS admits that it's targeting these conservative groups, and the Washington Free Beacon we went back, and we decided to talk to these pro-Israel groups that were in the Times. Um, and it turns out that we found at least five of them that were audited. So that means that they were after other groups because they were, do you, do you take this to mean that they were after those groups because they're pro-Israel and not for any other reason? Or I, I guess I always try to look for the reasonable explanation before I go to the unreasonable one, which is the one I believe is in operation here, that the administration, somewhere below the president, and maybe even up as high as the president, uh, that there are people using the IRS powers to to go after uh, you know uh, political groups or political individuals that they don't like or don't agree with. Yeah, I mean there could be a few reasons there. It, I mean it could be a complete coincidence that these groups were audited during that time frame. Audits happen. Um, it could be that IRS auditors were following some higher directives. Which one of the groups that we spoke to uh, that was their impression. They said that they had a feeling that this order was coming from higher up. Um, or it could be that the IRS auditors, you know, they were New York Times readers. They read about these groups in the papers, and they decided to go and audit them. Um, you know, these are bureaucrats. People have to go through thousands of groups and look for, you know, to choose which ones that they're going to audit. So they do pay attention to media reports. Well, Alana, uh, you know, it, it strikes all of us when we look at this. We know that the president's pretty good about keeping his fingerprints off things, generally by just claiming that he doesn't know a darn thing about what's going on inside his own government unless he reads it in a newspaper he trusts. But in this case, the fact that we've now found out that the former, now former commissioner of the IRS, Shulman, was one of the most frequent visitors to the White House, uh, nearly 150 times in a very short period of time, and visiting the White House even more frequently than, Sec- than, than the Secretary of State and then uh, uh, other members of the president's cabinet? How, how is it that anyone is going to maintain belief that the president didn't know about this when the IRS commissioner seemed to you know, visit the, uh, the White House so, so very often? I mean, is it possible that he went there all these times and he and the president never had conversations about these things? Or were his frequent visits because they didn't want to end up putting it down on paper or in some electronic form like an email or a text message that could be discovered later? Yeah, I mean, I think that you're exactly right. I don't think that there's a lot of public confidence right now um, you know, because of stories like this. Uh, there was a poll that said, seven, I think it was 76 percent of voters in a Quinnipiac poll said that uh, there should be an IRS special prosecutor to look into what's going on. So, you know, people are concerned about the independence of the agency and they want to make sure we're able to carry out an investigation that gets to the bottom of all this. Well, in fact, I kind of wonder what the White House is, what their strategy is, because when the president came out uh, a while ago, a week ago, and said, well, I'm going to solve all this by firing a guy who is going to leave his office in two weeks anyway, and... uh, (laughs) And so he, he's doing next to nothing about it in that way. But but even that assumption seemed, even that action seemed to belie his argument that this was a bunch of rogue agents uh, deeply buried in the bureaucracy of the IRS. Because if it was being done by a rogue group that the guy at the top had no way of knowing about, nor reporting on to the Secretary of the Treasury or to the President, then why fire that guy? Why not fire some people you know who are lower in the bureaucracy? 
But if he did know about it, and if the president is saying, I'm firing this guy because he, he's responsible, uh, then what you're saying is, then, then it must have been known that high. And then the question becomes, why is it the president's attorney, the, the White House counsel, uh, the IRS commissioner, all the significant figures in the administration have absolutely not a single clue about what's going on inside their own bureaucracies, and the president appears willing to tolerate that lack of knowledge and lack of informing him. Yeah, well, I mean, I think and this is another reason why people are supporting having a, a special prosecutor on this, because, I mean, we don't even know, you know, uh, so Schulman and, uh, well, Steve Miller, so he stepped down. Um, but, you know, was he a scapegoat in this situation? I, I feel like that's potentially why you see Lois Lerner pleading the fifth, because, you know, nobody wants to be the person who's... Who, who's going to be the state scapegoat in this situation. See, the other thing about Lois Lerner, it's one thing, well, there's one objection because she walks in, gives some testimony, and then pleads the fifth. My understanding is once you've opened up to, to, to testimony, it would be the equivalent, I suppose, of being on trial in, in one of these courtroom trials that some of the cable networks like to spend so much time on, and getting up on the stand, telling your side, and then declaring to the courtroom, I'm not answering any more questions because those might implicate me, but I got to say my piece. That's one objection. But the second one is, if she's... It, my understanding from the attorneys, because I'm not an attorney, is that if you're going to claim the fifth, it's not just a general blanket immunity from answering questions. You and your lawyer, since she's represented by a lawyer, have to honestly believe that your testimony might implicate you in a crime. If she's afraid of being implicated in a crime, what crime is it she's afraid she might have committed? Bec yeah, no, that's a, a very good point. And I mean, I think the expectation is in Washington is, is that she's going to have to go back and she's going to have to actually testify and what she'll have to do when she does go back is just plead the fifth on each of the individual questions that she gets asked so she'll just basically have to sit there and say in every question you know i'm, I'm taking the fifth on this or you know i can't answer that because i'm concerned about implicating myself so well uh, there I, there is another possibility isn't there the possibility of use immunity where she walks in and says, fine, I'll answer your questions. You have to grant me immunity. Now, she's a relatively small fish in that most Americans never knew her name until this whole scandal broke. But if she walks in and says, fine, I'll tell you everything, but you give me immunity, and then she unrolls the whole, you know, the whole package on everybody above her and around her who might be implicated in this, that that sounds like a person who could be very dangerous to this administration. She could have them in a whole bunch of trouble. Yeah, no, I definitely imagine that's probably a nightmare scenario for the administration. I mean, it might even be the cleanest way for her to get out. At this point, uh, I would I assume that her career in government is pretty well uh, trashed. So I'm not sure she's trying to make sure that she can pre preserve her job prospects. So what what re reason would there be other than politics not to completely go state's evidence on everybody around her uh, that, that probably did commit crimes. Alana, you want to remind people where they can find your stories about this uh, subject? Sure, it's at thewashingtonfreebeacon.com. It is a pleasure, as always, to have you on the program. Thanks for taking the time tonight. Thanks for having me. You bet. Alana Goodman, who is a staff writer at the Washington Free Beacon. We'll be glad to get your phone calls and emails. There's a lot to talk about.